also going to be speaking in tonight is the Coast Salish language of Lushut seed, um, uh, a language which is which has been here and is still here and is getting ever stronger. We are going to have tonight, and we are delighted. Um, they are in fact they're up rather late in the night because they are in um, Eastern North America, Turtle Island, um, uh, both in uh, what's the Canadian province of Ontario, but going by that kind of nomenclature, and that is having um, Leanne Betasama Sake Simpson and Robin Menard here for this extraordinary book that they have done together. Um, th I'm holding up the US edition um, from our friends at Haymarket Books, um, Rehearsals for Living, uh, a book that was written between the two of them, an exchange of letters um, two years ago as everything that happened in 2020 was happening. Um, and draws on incredible um, exchanges between them. Um, this book, I mean, it's almost quaint to talk about a book of letters because we don't see, or he, people don't refer to letters so much anymore um, with all the other forms of exchange we have. But what they do with each other in um, writing of what they see going on, they draw deeply on their each, each of the work they've done for years um, in practice, in activism, and in writing and scholarship. Um, each um, is deeply um, written and schooled in various ways um, and the authors of very important books. And um, they bring that to bear in this book as well as um, observation and life and what they're doing to, to get through the worst stages of the pandemic as they were going happening in 2020. And then what was all happening um, throughout the world politically and socially during that time. And um, also, there's so many things they do in this book. They do all those things. There's family observations, family life. But there are, it's also an incredible book to send any of us to other reading. Um, there is, um, I think of, in the book, there's about 40 pages in the back of the book, which are actually notes and things. But there's you know, writers, um, Tony K. Bambara and Audre Lorde and um, Glenn Cothard and others referred to, drawn on Audra Simpson, so many other writers and scholars of indigenous and um, black um, power and, and writing and and everything. Um, it's a book that um, has been has actually in its forward and afterward has um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Robin DG Kelly um, uh, writing about what they've done and other writers of similar range and verve have um, been among those welcoming um, the book into the world. Robin Menard of the two is a little bit less known in the US only um, because the one book um, that she's really well known for, Policing Back Lives, published five years ago by a very wonderful and powerful, important um, independent Canadian publisher, Fernwood, but the book hasn't had the best distribution of that publisher. They have it better now, but it's um, a book, but it's a book that activists and scholars um, here know very much. And it's a book we've been putting in people's hands here as well. And Leanne Simpson, who, well, and there's also, there's a part about, sorry, but Robin, um, who's, they're both, who was in Toronto, where she's an assistant professor of black feminisms in Canada at the University of Toronto Scarborough and has, as, as Rehearsals and Living um, shows, been long active both in the scholarly worlds, but also very much in community and uh, um, other spheres there in Toronto and throughout Canada and beyond. Um, then I was about to say, Leanne was with us early last year um, when her uh, novel was first published in the US, as I'm holding up the Canadian edition, which is the one I've got before, I couldn't wait for the US one, Nupaming, um, The Cure for White Ladies, um, which comes after such books she's done as, as we have always done, um, uh, Dancing on Turtle's Back, and other books of both scholarship and stories. Since that time with us, um, she's had another book published. Um, this beautiful book, both the art and what's in it, um, A Short History of the Blockade with the great subtitle, Giant Beavers, Diplomacy and Regeneration in Nishnab Nebowan. Um, she is with us from um, um, Michi, Michi Sabig, Nishnabeg country and um, is also part of Ontario and, um, as also, uh, and Karen, I think we'll get much in the chat of uh, uh, recording and performing um, musician. And um, her first album, Nuvaming Sessions, came out in 2020. And then um, last year saw the release of Theory of Ice, um, 
from You've Changed Records and it's we it's extraordinary music. She's also out doing music as well as things with books. Um, to say a little bit more than um, they will be reading from this and this is a book of great writing um, and conversing. They've been doing this um, in various other places and ways since the book has come out, but it's also draws such on such um, conversations that happened then. And I have a feeling the conversations have really continued. Um, we hope you'll put questions, comments and questions in the chat and I'll come in at the end um, to say a few things. The other thing to say is that uh, my colleague, Karen Maeda Allman, who is um, not being so visible here, um, is tonight working as, as she has for these last two years on these virtual programs, um, doing so tonight. And um, tonight basically concludes uh, 23 years of her incredible work at Elliott Bay. Uh, she's retiring. Um, her work at Elliott Bay was preceded by years at um, Seattle's um, Red and Black Collective Bookstore, which um, has played such a big part in um, in Seattle and, and beyond. And um, her work uh, in the community in all sorts of ways um, is cherished and has been vital. And, um, and her presence will be missed, but um, she gives us all something to work on and for and towards. So we thank and acknowledge her as part of that as well. And she, I think, wanted to be part of this tonight. I was also, um, she said, I want to go out on a high note and uh, we can't think of a more um, inspiring, uh, engaged and um, um, emp empowering um, pair to hear from than Robin Menard and Leanne Betasamasake Simpson. And so, um, now we ask you to please join in giving good virtual attention and applause to they, those two, and they will um, carry forth. Thank you both. Um, thank you so much for having us, for hosting us. It's so great to be here. Uh, I really want to send appreciation uh, to Karen, especially for sharing your very last uh, virtual event with us. And thank you, Rick, for that for that lovely introduction. Um, I know that we had planned to start off today with with readings. So I will begin with a reading from my first letter uh, to Leanne, which is the how the book begins. Dear Leanne, I've been meaning to write you for a long time, and yet it's hard to know where to begin. So I guess I will start where I'm at. I can't stop doom sc scrolling the multiple crises of our time. At this moment, I'm preoccupied and filled with dread by the reports of rising temperatures, the just about last chances regularly announced by climate scientists, the continually shelved fact that things must be drastically and immediately shifted if we are to avoid untold suffering. I'm preoccupied with what goes unwritten in so many reports, but what I know in my bones. Some communities untold suffering will vastly exceed that experienced by others. Some communities have been facing untold suffering for multiple generations. I don't want to live in this preoccupation, in this dread that sometimes comes to visit me and threatens to immobilize. So I suppose this is me reaching out simply for a leveling of the grounds beneath my feet, for communion, to help transform the source of this dread into a place from which we can instead plot, conspire, dream, and attend to life otherwise to attend to the celebration, the preservation of life without eliding our own community's intimate proximity to death and loss. Talking and thinking with you has always helped me focus on the vitality, the livingness of the traditions that our work emerges from, regardless of what the last several centuries of European atrocities have wreaked on our peoples. Our conversations are a salve against the sharp edges of everyday life, but I don't see you as much as I would like and the phone is not my medium. So I've decided to write you this letter. I'm writing you a letter even though it feels cringy because I'm shy. I'm writing you a letter even though I may never send it, even though you may never write me back. I'm writing to you a letter at the end of this world. From Cyclone Idai in Malawi, Mozambique and Zimbabwe, to Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas, the devastating forest fires displacing indigenous communities from the Amazon rainforest through to the Mishkogamega Ojibwe Nation in Northwest Ontario. Our respective communities, that is, Black and Indigenous communities, are collectively positioned on the very forefront of the unfolding catastrophe. It would require a deliberate obfuscation 
to view the racially uneven distribution of harms that the climate collapse engenders as accidental. Even if we didn't take into account the melting of Arctic ice caps, rising seawaters and eroded shorelines, desertification and species extinction that are now nearly, if not totally inevitable. The reality is that not only are an array of world endings already before us, they have already arrived. Our respective communities have borne already multiple apocalypses that were inflicted upon us, if unidentically, from the barbarity time of genocide, slavery, settler colonialism. The apocalypse is imagined, after all, in most classic Euro-Western settler tropes, in terms of the lack of clean drinking water, the destruction of the places we, they, live, the poisoning of the earth, inhumane and restrictive responses to people left hungry, displaced, in desperation. This is a condition that is already deeply familiar to our kin across Turtle Island and globally. To remix Public Enemy, Armageddon been in effect. It is the apocalypses of slavery and settler colonialism that bind our collective pasts and presents together in the calamity at hand. Today, the racially uneven environmental catastrophes of the present are inextricably connected to the unfinished catastrophes of 1492, the two genocides at the heart of the Americas, to paraphrase M. Norbessi Philip, when a death-making commitment to extraction and dispossession took hold on a global scale. In this burgeoning global logic and political economy, our ancestors became, through distinct but interrelated processes, what Cedric J. Robinson once described as a collection of things of convenience for use and or eradication. The factory of post-apocalyptic life that has unfolded its dramas over the last half millennium means that our collective histories are mapped out too onto the racially and geographically differentiated vulnerabilities amidst the present future disaster. As we are confronted with the crisis of the Earth's viability then, amidst so many crises, I am writing you so we can think together about what it means for us to build livable lives together in the wreckage. That's so moving uh, for me to hear you read that letter every time, Robin. It's, it's like the first time that I got it. So, Ani Kinawaya, Gitagabizuna Denoema, Kinakatina Shabako, Dominga Donjava, Nagojawani Mekado Da, Vidas Musaki, and Dignitas. It's so wonderful to be zooming in to the Wanish homeland. I'm so grateful uh, to Rick and to Karen and Elliot Bay Book for uh, being so supportive of my, my career for so long. Sometimes for writers outside of the US, it's really hard to um, sell any books in the US. So I'm, I'm really super glad that, uh, that Rick's been so supportive. And I'm also really, really grateful to, um, to Haymarket Books. It's been sort of a lifelong career dream to be published by Haymarket and so, They've just been lovely and supportive as well. Um, so I'm gonna read a little bit from, from my first letter back to Robin. Robin wrote her first letter, I think in the fall of 2019. And I felt like her letter was an invitation for me to think alongside. As Rick said in the introduction, these aren't sort of just two letters between friends, they're two letters between dorky, geeky activist friends. And so we're doing a lot of reading. There's tons of footnotes and, and we're trying to engage uh, deeply in the, in the world around us. So it took me a while to <laughs> compose my, my letter back to Robin. And by the time I got around to that, it was uh, at the very beginning of the um, COVID-19 pandemic, which is probably the stay-at-home order that, that gave me the time. And so this is my, an excerpt from, from my first letter back to Robin. Robin, the first thing I underlined in my now worn out copy of your book, Policing Black Lives, was the very first line of the acknowledgement section. Quote, writing Policing Black Lives was a community affair born out of movement work is geared towards nourishing those same movements 
that have given me life over the last few years. I knew after reading that first line that this book was going to be distinct. Policing Black Lives was written for different reasons than most books published in Canada, reasons that I had profound respect for. Knowledge, research, analysis, and writing born out of movement work and geared towards nourishing, sustaining, and propelling movements for Black lives. Robust intellectual work in service of radical Black futurities. Policing Black Lives holds up community and shines a light on the generations of freedom fighters whose individual and collective sacrifices have brought us to this moment. As I read on, I underlined your careful and gentle insistence that Black and Indigenous struggles, while distinct, were also linked. This was significant to me because it gestured towards a more rigorous and nuanced relationality between Black and Indigenous communities, reminiscent of radical Black feminist traditions embodied in so many. Writers like Makeda Silvera, Nervesi Philip, Dion Brandt, and Althea Cooper. In Policing Black Lives, you were the first one to gather together the work of Black feminists and organizers and provide us with a volcano of meticulously researched evidence that destroyed Canadian innocence and exceptionalism with regards to transatlantic slavery and anti-Blackness. In Policing Black Lives, you taught me abolition on stolen land is the practice of caring. My book, as we've always done, came out in the same year as your Policing Black Lives. I remember wishing your book had come out first because it would have made, as we have always done, more complete and rigorous. I would have brought Policing Black Lives into conversation with the chapters in As We Have Always Done, and from an Indigenous perspective, pointed towards the same robust and nuanced relationality between Indigenous and Black communities you had done in Policing Black Lives, albeit from my own Nishinaabe perspective. When an occasion presented itself to launch, as we have always done in Jojaga or Montreal, in Ganegihaga or Mohawk territory, where you were living at the time, I wanted to invite you into a conversation, a thinking through between ourselves and our book. You graciously accepted the invitation and our conversation took place on April 14, 2018 was the very first time we had met in person. I remember the Black community of Montreal showing up in power at the event. I remember being very nervous, as one should be, when their first encounter with someone is on a stage with a mic in front of a beautiful, articulate, intelligent audience. I remember your pink lipstick. I remember my bull steps. I remember being painfully aware I was dressed like I was from Ontario. I can't remember very much about what we talked about, but we obviously had the sense to record it because there is an edited transcript of part of our conversation in the book, Until We Are Free, Reflections on Black Lives Matter in Canada. This was our first visit. Roughly a year later in 2019, as part of my work at the Distinta Center for Research and Learning in Benende, I helped conceptualize, organize, and actualize a solidarity gathering that took place in March in the territory of the Yellowknives Dene First Nation. Our idea was simple, to invite a small group of Black, Brown, and Indigenous activists, thinkers, writers, and organizers to spend time with us in the spring on an island in what the Yellowknives Dene know as Tinde, or Big Lake. Together, we fished nets under the ice, traveled by snowmobile and sleigh across the frozen lake, shared moose ribs cooked over the fire, stories from the elders, our own idea and time with each other. We wanted to invest in our relationship with each other and our affinities outside of the institution, the internet and crises, because we believed that the land would pull out a different set of conversations and gift us with a different way of relating. We wanted to sit together on the land, immersed in a Dene world, engaged in a practice of Dene hospitality to see if we related to each other in a different way. This is exactly what happened. 
the land nurtured a set of conversations and way of relating to each other outside of the institution and its formation. I remember you and I eating muskbox around the fire, talking about how different eating muskbox around the fire in the bush was from meeting in a hallway or bar or at a conference or interacting online. We were also meeting and there was no crisis or blockade or protest or agenda. We were coming together to nurture each other, to relate to each other, to listen and share and to breathe together to use my basic Phillips thinking. I could intellectualize about the experience and speak in terms of relationality and relationship building, something I think black and indigenous activists in the 1960s and 1970s understood far better than us. I could talk about this from an indigenous methodological angle with visiting and developing relationships of trust as foundational to any exchange of knowledge and experience. I could write about the spiritual dimensions of this work from again an indigenous perspective, being surrounded by trees, medicine, air, sky, and water. In a sense though, none of that particularly matters other than to say, I think that land-based politics grounded in a sustained and nurturing relationship with the natural world and in protecting nature as a means of protecting ourselves can be one generative means of nourishing black and indigenous politics of solidarity. Our starting point was simple, that land and place making, although perhaps different, were and remained important to both black and indigenous peoples. Our starting point was a refusal of the nation state and the racial capitalism, white supremacy, and heteropatriarchy embodied in those structures. Our starting point was a recognition that transatlantic slavery, and as Saidea Hartman says, its afterlives and colonialism mean we have distinctive and intertwined histories, presences, and distinctive and intertwined theory and world building practices. We imagine the synergistic potential of Black land politics and Indigenous land politics towards liberated lands and bodies. After that gathering, the possibilities to continue this work seemed endless. Trips to the Sugar Bush, hikes in downtown Toronto, exchanges between our freedom schools, gatherings in the Caribbean, and then the pandemic hit. Our lives shrunk into our home spaces during stay-at-home orders. There was an urgency in addressing the pandemic under white supremacy because we knew that black, brown and indigenous peoples are always the first to die and that any state solutions will be made to first save white people's lives and livelihoods. Zoom seemed like the very last place we wanted to continue this work. In fact, to me, it felt like virtual environments were antithetical to this work. And so you and I decided to write each other letters because we couldn't see each other in person. As an honored radical black feminist methodology of scaffolding the intimate and the personal within the global, letter writing made sense. We decided to not only write what we know, but to attempt to think through, through things together, to generate through this intentional relationship, a sort of study of black and indigenous relationality through the study of our own responsive relationality. In hindsight, and after reading Catherine McKittrick's Dear Science, each of us drew on our distinctive rebellious methodologies in this project. For you, Black theory, story, knowledge, and methodologies of knowledge production. And for me, Anishinaabe story is theory, knowledge, and methodologies of knowledge production. The intersection with friendship, collaboration, song, story, movement work, citations, analytics, and oral practice. The interstitial spaces are this project. So that's um, an excerpt from, from the first letter that I, I sent to Robin. And then Robin and I continued to write each other um, until I think the fall, um, is that correct, Robin? My last letter to you was in November. November. I remember because it was when the wildfires were happening, one of the times you know that the wildfires wow. were happening in California, yeah. And one of the things that I love about this project is that we didn't set out 
to write a book. So we didn't have a grant and we didn't have research objectives. We set out, I think, I think you just set out to write to write one letter. And um, it was such an invitation and, and an engagement that I wanted to return that and sort of that um, reciprocity, I think, of intellectual and emotional work that went into those letters sort of propelled this project as a very personal and intimate sort of intellectual project, political project for the two of us. And then do you want to maybe talk about your walk with Dion? Sure. Um... I remember, I can't remember where the conversation took place, but so, you know, as you know, Leanne, I mean, I really wrote you that letter. I think just because, I mean, as you articulated so beautifully, I think in your second letter that sort of lays out the architecture of how all of this happened, um, you know, it was really just a way of of trying to reach out, of trying to connect over the many crises. And, you know, as you'd said, it wasn't, to, it wasn't about a book necessarily. It was just sort of trying to think through things with you. Um, in a way that I'd already enjoyed doing that so much in so many other formats. So I remember um, having a conversation with Dion and she was asking, you know, what are you working on <laughs> right now? And I was like, well, there's many things on the go, but I also have this, you know, I, uh, I, I've i written Leanne this letter, we're sort of writing each other. I don't know, <laughs> there's no net, there's no plan or outcome necessarily, but I, you know, I was more just talking about it as something that I was interested in and that I was thinking about. Um, and then she was just incredibly encouraging that, you know, that she wanted to read it, that this sounded like it was a book and, you know, if Dion Brand tells you that something, you know, that, that she wants to read something, that something is a book, then you're, it's something that you would follow up on. So I remember getting in touch with you after that and being like, oh, <laughs> you know, what, what, what do you have, what do you, what do you think about this possibility? Because we really, it had been something that was such a personal project. So I think for me, initially, the idea of this being read beyond you was something that felt, you know, uh, it, it was something that was this world that we built between the two of us. So now I think it's so interesting and beautiful to see the ways in which, you know, first Dion read it and then Knopf and then now it's this 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 pizza so that's out in the world and finding, you know, we, now we get to converse with it through people like Ellen Gabriel, through Robin D.G. Kelly last night, and it sort of become its own as opposed to the home space where we sort of live and think together, it's become one conversation that now leads to these other conversations beyond this. So it's something that I think from this very small uh, letter, which I think the first time I wrote to you, I was um, visiting one of my parents, uh, you know, in, in Winnipeg, right? Um, so it just, you know, it's taken this thing from just me and my laptop and you and uh, really expanded into this, into something that I, I don't think I could have expected or foreseen before. So one of the parts of the process that I wanted to ask you about is this sort of the the process that we went through in taking these these very personal sort of intimate letters that was this political project kind of between the two of us and then the act of turning it into a book for for a wide a wide audience and I was really really grateful to Naomi Mirakawa for being. Um, a meticulous and rigorous and and just I don't know spent so much time I think with the text thinking really deeply with it um, and I haven't had that in my my work before actually um, that level of of care and editing and I feel like I feel so indebted to her actually because I think that um, she made me a better writer and I learned so much from from her comments Mm -hmm. um, but I just wanted to sort of talk to you about sort of that that process because I remember us being very trying to be very meticulous around citations and where we were getting ideas and very careful around the way that we were um, nuancing certain conversations. Um, but at the same time, I think the letters are pretty pretty close to the ones that we originally sent each other. So what was what was that? It, that process like for you? Well, it's interesting because I think that what felt so important, I think I was nervous about the idea that these letters that I'd written to you, you know, would be edited because I think they lived so much in the present. But as you'd highlighted, you know, getting the kind of feedback that we got from Naomi, uh, from Lynn Henry at Knopf, you know, this really detailed, really just sort of thoughtful and artful uh, editing was something that to me was absolutely a, the most enjoyable editing experience I've ever had. But it was so, um, I think that that process 
didn't do what I had worried it would do, which would actually sort of change the content and feeling of, of the letters, you know? So I remember, you know, the first letter that I wrote to you, it was not yet the pandemic, right? So it's just me doom strolling with the climate crisis and thinking through these traditions of black and indigenous radicalism and ways of thinking about world ending and world beginning. Um, and, you know, the tone is so different from writing you at four in the morning, doing legal support, um, you know, for uh, defund the policing um, action, uh, you know, when the, when the Ryerton, when the Ryerson statue was uh, redecorated beautifully, right? Mm -hmm. So there's this feeling of urgency writing in that letter. And I think that, you know, some, an edit, an, an over, sort of an over heavy editing could have really taken away, I think, for example, what it felt like to really be in that moment and to be writing in this adrenaline high and sitting with your letter. <laughs> you know, I remember on my kitchen table and at the same time fielding these phone calls, right? So I think that it was really, uh, you know, it was really important to sort of try to keep really true to the form of it while also just making sure that, you know, in a book that's so dedicated to thinking alongside um, our communities to the kind of intellectual traditions that we're coming from, that we do really justice to uh, the way that ideas move through movement and through scholarship and back and forth, right? So I think that was, I think for me, uh, some, of, some of the most important places where editing had to happen as well as just, you know, sometimes you just need to finesse finesse something a little further, but I do think that what I really appreciated was that I think each of your letters too has kind of a different emotional tone, right? Depending on what was happening at the time with you, depending on, you know, if you're thinking with your children at that time, right? So I find that it really sort of shifted through that. I don't know um, if you wanted to talk a little bit about how you feel about where you were at, at, you know, at this, when you wrote me the first letter versus the end and even where you might've landed now. I think one of the things that I'm noticing as we launch this book is that this book has transformed me. <laughs> and I think it's transformed the way that I think about the world in a powerful way. And it's, it's transformed my work. And so I think, talking about the editing process and our the care that the editors took is is one part of that I think your letters and as Rick said in the introduction um there's also sort of almost reading list it's, there's a syllabus sort of um I think it, it gestures towards kind of a, a syllabus a political syllabus um so there's all this this reading and all this thinking and I think that I come out of the book thinking differently and making different interventions into the communities that I work with and that I'm a part of, uh, making different interventions into Indigenous studies. I'm reading different things now. So I think that's a really beautiful thing because I, I, I learned, and I learned that from you, that um, one line you had in there that every day you kind of get up and you remake the world and you relearn the world um, with the curiosity of a child. And I think that's so important at this point in my career and at this point of my life, because I think so many times when writers are on like six or seven books, it's, it's easy to just <laughs> write sort of the same book over and over again. And so I feel like that was really powerful. I also, another part that was really powerful for me is the fact that these are letters and I think if we had sat down and, and been like, I don't think if we had talked about it before, if you and I had planned to write a book together, it would have been letters. It would have, we would have approached it as academics and activists and intellectuals. And we even, I remember a lot of conversations we had about taking the letter component out of this and just putting kind of creative nonfiction or academic sort of titles and taking the I out of it and speaking to that authoritarian voice. And yeah. I think that what's interesting is that we ended up in discussions with editors and publishers not doing that. And then there's a humility that comes through in the book that I think audiences connect with. And there's this divestment of power in terms of like, I'm not an expert on these things. I'm thinking through these things. I'm continually learning um, in work around world building and world making. You have to be continually doing that because we don't have the bodies of knowledge we need to, to build these next worlds. And so I think I was worried about that though also because I feel like this is, this is the work of an indigenous feminist and a black feminist. We're already up against <laughs> mm -hmm. 
anti-blackness, racism, heteropatriarchy, it's going to be very easy for, for people to dismiss a book around letters as, as being sort of not rigorous intellectual work, which I think I think the book is. Yeah, I feel so glad, you know, I'm I'm actually so glad you're bringing this up because I forgot that at one point we were talking about what else it might be. And I mm -hmm. think that it would have been, it would have really done a disservice to what we were trying to do because I think that it's the vulnerability. I think it was, it felt very scary in one way, right? To put out a book of letters, the letter, like letters between you and I into the world. But at the same time, now when I look, when I read back on it, I, to me, those vulnerabilities, um, you know, the, there's an, there's an I and there's a perhaps sort of in the structure of it that I think actually is what really um, bring, brings different parts to light for me in a different way. And I think that at some point I remember just drawing, looking back to, you know, writers like Audre Lorde and others who, you know, and this way that she talks about the erotic and the importance of, you know, of that, that sort of self essence that you could call that you could call the erotic, right. But of, of keeping this and thinking about the courage that it took, uh, you know, people who are poets and theorists in, in that way. And I think just remembering at one point, you know, I think it's worth it to keep, to keep that, to keep this both, to sort of insist that personal is also theoretical, is also rigorous, right? I think that that's something that that's a decision that maybe I didn't think about consciously, but where I did sort of arrive at that time that it would be important. And that, you know, the world anyways derides Black and Indigenous feminist thought as like women's, you know, there, there's so many ways that work is dismissed anyways, but we don't write to the, to those people, right? We're writing to each other first and foremost, we're writing to our communities, we're writing to, um, you know, the organizing and intellectual and broader sort of school of thought of, of our people, right? So I think that deciding to keep it in its original context for me is something that I'm, I'm really glad that we had, that we had decided to do. I think it could have still been it's still, you know, it still could have been very interesting, but I do think that it sort of gave itself its own life in this way. I've noticed that it's so difficult now because I went through so many experiences with you writing this book, right? Like I lived through the first wave uh, and second, I, perhaps third, I forget now. <laughs> it's hard to keep track at seven, but of, of this pandemic with you through, you know, the summer of revolt, the black led street, -led, you know, the black and multiracial street rebellions, uh, hunger strikes, through the wildfires of the fall and now I find it so difficult I don't know if you feel the same way but when I experienced something when the buffalo massacre happened uh you know I remember te texting you you know I can only really process this through yeah. writing you a letter right because something had happened in now my mind and the way that I want to sort of take in difficult um moments and it's almost that part of my mind goes dear Leanne that that's part of how actually my synapses have sort of rerouted themselves to process information so I feel like it's changed my my thinking in a way that's made it more collaborative and that's made it more like wondering with with you and with with others and I think it's just made it for, for a kind of more collective thinking practice if that makes sense yeah I mean I miss writing you letters for sure <laughs> and I miss being engaged I miss that um this was a really really beautiful productive space that that we sort of created out of nothing and I like um in working with sort of PhD students and master's students um, that have read this, I, I see them finding the power and sort of this idea of thinking through and thinking alongside that black feminists have, have done for so many years um, as a more useful way of engaging with text and of, um, and of generating sort of, sort of new ideas. But I do really miss but I, I think it was hard to stop writing the letters. And I think there's a little bit of grief, but I also think that I didn't, I didn't really move on. Like it's been kind of a year and I'm still, I'm still I really, I really wonder what Robin thinks of this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I know you have to get your dissertation done. I know you have to have books that you need to write. It's not as fun, but <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, it's different once I think, I think that now that I've managed to sort of move my mind in this direction, that's thinking more collectively, that's thinking more with the personal, which is something that I had not done as much in the past, something that I had almost 
sort of strangely stepped away from in this, you know, in this way. I feel like I wrote myself out of policing Black lives in some way, even though it was a book that was describing movements that I was very much a part of, right, towards decriminalizing sex work, um, you know, uh, pushing against the criminalization of drugs, racial profiling, deportations, all of these things were, you know, those, I, was, I was part of those movements, but I didn't exist in the text in that way. And I think it had to exist. I think the text had to be written the way that it did, but it was a really different exercise to be writing with an I, with a we, and with all of this. And I think it might be difficult to move all the way. I don't think I would ever step all the way back, if that makes sense, into the way that I had written That does before. make sense, because I think one of the things that we were, we were worrying, well, I, I was worried about is that your writing, that we write very differently. Policing Black Lives is, is different. Um, I feel like you've got like meticulous research. You've got an unwavering voice. Um, it's beautiful, beautiful writing. And then I feel like I was just like the poet kind of like riding on your coattails. And I was like, yeah, and you're gonna have to kind of step things up. You can't just write like a beautiful few lines and then coast on it. So I was worried at one point that like you're, you were gonna have these sort of amazing kind of fire. And then I was gonna be like poeting around in my letters. And so I think, and I've always used, um, I've always grounded my work in sort of the personal as um, an expression of a Anishinaabe intellectual practice where humility is really important to my people and to me. And um, we have like grammatically, you can only say what you what you think and um, you, you don't ever have, you shouldn't ever be using an authoritarian voice no living being really has the right to do that. And so I had had always sort of used this, this very personal and paid a price for that because a lot of times, um, particularly in the academy, my work gets dismissed as, as uh, not being intellectually rigorous because of that. And so I felt like this book, I was able to keep that and then also kind of meet you um, with more kind of intellectual rigor, I think. And so that was, I, I like now kind of going back and reading it, it feels really, really well matched. Like we both sort of found this, this rhythm in, in the letter writing that um, that isn't so, isn't as disjointed as I guess I was worried about. And I yeah, like, um, I think the thing that I loved about you through this is like your work ethic. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> like you send Robin an email, you get an email back. You send Robin a like 20 page letter, you get a 20 page letter back. And so there was this momentum because I guess we're both, maybe maybe we both work a lot. <laughs> there was a beautiful momentum in this book that um, I think happened really naturally. The whole thing actually unfolded so so naturally. Um, and would have been a beautiful and, and would have probably probably would without beyond sort of intervention we probably just would be have a stack full of of letters in our in our inbox right now yeah. I mean I printed them out and I have a really great drawer filled which at this point I was like maybe I can retire this because it's not active anymore but I can't really bring <laughs> myself to do it so I just have this huge drawer next to my desk filled with all of our letters and all of my notes to self and like mm -hmm. napkins where I'd scribbled things I didn't want to forget and I don't want to I'm like not yet ready to part with it, you know, but that's so funny that you're mentioning. I mean, I don't think we've ever talked about this. So I also had been sort of intimidated in the same way, but because I was writing with this fabulous poet, author of seven books, I was like, what have I done? <laughs> I've overcommitted, uh, you know, so the idea of really sort of trying to meet uh and trying, I think, yeah, what the the middle place that we ended up finding with the uh, finding with the writing, and then what I'm realizing now as I'm thinking about it is there's also these sort of similarities I think that really binds us together in this book, but also in in our other works, right? Which is like let's talk about this present moment, but to do so actually we need to jump back 400 years to these root causes, and we need to actually look at these particular instances that made the now possible. And actually, what this makes us do is think about the future, right? So I do think that there's this way that um, we both do work that hops around the world and across centuries and across time. Yeah. So maybe that was sort of the anchor that that anchored it, you know? Um, yeah. Or maybe I know that that's something that drew me to your writing, especially when I read as we as we had always done, but more broadly before that, right? That there's this refusal 
of presentism, but it's not a sort of dry historical chronology either, right? There's something, um, you know, um, M. Jackie Alexander calls it palimpsestic time, right? This idea of moving like this, <laughs> that I think that your work takes up really well. And yeah. I think what I'm really proud of is sort of our process that we trusted this process, this process emerged, um, that we worked really hard and that also we shut down all of those like there's this old person doing writing a book with a PhD student <laughs> what is this poet doing writing a book with um a really powerful emerging um intellectual and shutting all of that down and just um doing the work and trusting our gut and our hearts and then generating this this first draft of a manuscript, it was like we gave um, ourselves permission to write what we read it, needed to read in this moment of time, and then um, got it to this place where we, we had sort of a first draft, and then thought about what is it going to be like for folks in our communities to read this, folks in our families to read this, people from outside of, of our communities, and then sort of take on that editing process. So. I'm really, I'm really proud that we kind of trusted that process and thought through for those, for that kind of year of writing. Yeah, me too. So. I'm glad I ended up having the courage to actually send you the letter because I very much almost didn't because, you know, we were getting to know one another very well, but we weren't quite at that time yet close, right? So it felt like such a, it felt like a jump in levels and I wasn't sure if you know, if I, if I should or would. So I remember writing it and then thinking, I wonder, <laughs> and I didn't send it right away. So I'm really glad that we'd sort of decided that I decided to actually send you a letter that you decided to write me back. And in the end, so much more, you know, has, has There's a question that. in the chat. Did the editor remove from the draft anything that you preferred to have published? No, um, the editing process was amazing. I think it's sometimes I would have this visceral reaction to like deletions and then I would reread it and reread it and then be like, yes, no, correct. <laughs> um, I think that, and there is often, so I think to me, the only kinds of things that were removed, I feel like were things that were repent that had been said that, that were repetitive, right? I think that the nuance uh, and rigor that Naomi and Lynn really brought to this process was just sometimes in trying to pull out a little bit more of a thought, but um, I think really respected, I felt, um, you know, my work and my words and, and the ideas that I was getting at. So, uh, no, I would say that there is nothing that, there's nothing that removed that I wished, that I wish I had kept. I think I felt really listened to in the editorial process because anytime that um, we would get a comment back, like this is, this is repetitive. If like I felt there was a, a reason, if I felt strongly that there was a reason that that, you know, those three lines should be in there, I felt confident enough to say that to the editors and have a conversation around that. Um, so I feel like that was a really important, they, they developed a, a really strong relationship of trust with us. Mm -hmm. So I think that we could, um, we had really lovely conversations around that that made the manuscript clearer and stronger. Yeah. Absolutely. Are there any special events in the published book? That's another question from the chat. I mean, there's a pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> climate um, change. Hunger strikes, um, a climate collapsing. Um, you know, Beautiful yeah. uprising for Black life over that summer of 2020. Yeah. Um, so I'd say that there's also, you know, special moments like Leanne, one of the most powerful moments for me that you'd written early in the book is when you're talking about writing or running, sorry, with your daughter um, yeah. in a way and doing, and doing these high jumps. And that's something for me that's, it's a small, it's a granular event. It's, but to me, the sort of bringing that into it and what it means to be living through all of this tumultuous violence and trying to teach your daughter what you know what the world is around her but also her for sort of forcing you to take that break and really just live uh just live 
uh, at, at the same time, to me, that's something that's so powerful. So it's, I would say that that is also as special of an event as, you know, some of, you know, when I'm talking later about, you know, statues of slavery being thrown in the sea, to me that these things moved me, you know, in similar ways. I think ways the parts with our kids text. actually are those kind of special events because they don't exist in that state anymore. They've all, all three of them have grown up since, since those letters were written. And so that they're sort of, I think of you and Lamar gardening and um, and how, uh, you know, in five years, that, that's going to be like looking at a photograph um, because of the passage of time. Yeah. yeah. It's true. Even this summer when he was at the book launch and I was reading the part about the garden and about planting the squash and the corn and the beans. He, I don't know if you heard him. He was like, I don't like squash. <laughs> doesn't need squash anymore. <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> and then afterwards, he's like, why did you say that about the squash, mama? <laughs> so it's only, you know, it was only a few years afterwards, but it, we don't, he doesn't, we don't like squash anymore. I still planted one this year though I still think of you now whenever the particularly that part of the mm. garden actually comes up so uh so if if the audience has has questions you can put them in the chat or um or in the q a we're happy to um to take audience questions Uh, I'm, I'll come in here because we're, we are getting near the end anyway, and you, you're both doing this late. I, I've read the book twice, and I'm once out of excitement and, you know, just because I was excited waiting for this book, and then the second time to have more go in, and now I think I'm going to start it again, um, because there is a, so much in this. But one of the things I thought that you sort of touched on, but maybe not as much as I had noticed reading it, was that each of you... Um, sort of writes out what the other has done. I mean, um, Leanne writes out some of the work Robin's done and Robin, some of the work Leanne's done. And then that goes further and each of you ends up writing about what you've done, but you, you're writing it to each other and you're, you're writing to someone else who knows a lot. So it, it felt like you got, you were able to take it at a high level, a high plane there of, of engagement, knowing you, it really was like you were sort of raising the bar for each other with each other for each other in a way that as a reader it's just amazing to read because you're you're I think you're both taking yourselves deeper into your own work but you're also surprising each other by what you're saying and reading and in each other and where it goes it feels like in the book there's really there's a familiar familiarity with the work but also you're surprising each other um with each other and um and about your own work as it goes along that's the, I mean it is a little bit like Leanne said this herself about you know, both of you have in a way, yeah. but I think that um, I think that one of the things that happens in the editorial process, of course, like having sort of a private conversation then go public, is we spent a lot of time on citations. We spent a lot of time making sure that our arguments were clear and nuanced and that readers that might not have the same kind of background that Robin and I had enough information to follow along and have that bar raised. Um, and I think that um, we also wanted to make sure that we sort of were comfortable with what we were sharing publicly and had boundaries and that we felt safe in doing so. But I think I didn't want to write sort of that entry level book where you assume, or write to, a, to sort of a white audience, assuming that they don't know anything. We wanted to write to a black audience that was engaged, an indigenous audience that was engaged. And then I think that raises the bar for, uh, for white audiences and for non-indigenous and non-black audiences. And I, I, think that, um, I think that we're ready for that. We don't have to always be writing into that intro kind of, intro kind of book. And you, you don't, and your other work, Leanne, you, you, I don't think you do, and that's part of its power from what I, I yeah. Um, but that, yeah, but you're right, what you're saying there. Um, I don't see anything else, and though I 
probably could go on. I don't think this is the place to do it, especially as it's late where you both are and for some of the others who are with us. Um, so I think I think we'll say good night here and, and hope to pick this up again sometime when you both can be out this way, but to tell, mm -hmm. say to others um, who are with us and, and who um, can get to Chicago over Labor Day weekend, there's a socialism conference there. I think if you look up socialismconference.org, the Haymarket Books, which is the US publisher of Rehearsals for Living is very involved with it. And um, Robin and Leanne are both scheduled to be there um, and uh, in live and in person. So the forms of this will be um, that way as well. Um, thank you both. Um, it's been a great pleasure and honor for us to be able to do this with both of you. And um, Anthony um, with Haymarket is, is also behind the scenes and to thank Karen again and um, to say good night and thank you um, for this incredible work. Thank you both. Thank you so much for hosting and thank you, Karen. Thank you, Anthony. Thanks to everybody for coming. So appreciated. Yeah, miigwech everybody. Thank you. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye.